Hello, and welcome to Get the Facts. My name is Suzanne Bernier Robinson. I'll be your host today as we learn about ticks here in New Hampshire and some of the diseases that they can cause. Let me introduce our guest. I have Dr. Alan Eaton. He's with New Hampshire Cooperative Extension. Good morning. And Dr. Abigail Matthewson. Welcome. Thank you. And you're with the New Hampshire State Department of Health and Human Services. Wonderful. Can you tell us just a little bit about um, your roles? I work for UNH Cooperative Extension, so the kinds of things that I do with respect to ticks are applied research, but also education. And so that's the kind of stuff I do. I teach, but not uh, formal courses and so forth. So that's my role. I'm an entomologist, so I don't get into the medical end of things. Mm -hmm. At the state, I'm the Surveillance Epidemiology Program Manager and the Acting State Public Health Veterinarian. So I am heavily involved with the surveillance epidemiology we do, tracking the infectious diseases, um, not just for tick-borne diseases, but for flu, vaccine preventables, um, foodborne illnesses, HIV, STD, um, disaster epi, things like that. Wow. Oh, As the state public health veterinarian, I'm a resource for zoonotic diseases and questions about the interaction between human and animal health, mm. which sounds... tick-borne diseases are often zoonotic, so. Right, that sounds interesting. Yeah. Well, I think we need to really start with um, how many different types of species of ticks do we have here in New Hampshire and? Too many. Too many. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> We've got 15 species in oh, the you're state. Kidding? 15 that surprises different types. people. It really does. I was thinking probably three, maybe, maybe four, but we have 15 different types of ticks. There are three or four that get known, and they're in the news and so right. forth. But um, there's a lot that don't have common names, and are hard to distinguish with if you don't mm -hmm. have a microscope. So mm -hmm. many people wouldn't know they're out there. So we're we're tick rich. Be, be proud. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to be proud about that. <laughs> so what are the most common ticks? that? The two most common species that we have, are the most common is American dog tick, which is I, the, the large one that's four or five millimeters long. It's ornate. And, uh, is that the one people refer to as the wood tick sometimes? Uh, sometimes erroneously referred to as the wood tick. It's a, a species that is not involved in spread of Lyme disease, nor anaplasmosis, nor babesiosis. Mm -hmm. So basically it's not a threat, not a significant threat here. The mm -hmm. second most common uh, tick that we have in the state is black-legged tick. That's the one that spreads all three of those that I just oh, mentioned, plus okay. another couple. Mm -hmm. And that's the one we're most concerned about. It's the smaller one and uh, it's been on the increase. Uh, both species actually have been increasing in numbers in the last uh, 20 years or so, but mm -hmm. especially the uh, black-legged tick. Mm -hmm. And is that the one that most people refer to as uh, commonly called the deer tick? It used to be called deer tick, and the okay. correct, correct name is black-legged tick. the black-legged, and I'm assuming it has black legs, and if you can find the tick, that you can actually see the... Yeah, it's, it's fairly easy to tell in the adult stage anyway what the worrisome ones are. Uh, if you see something that's ornate, in other words, it has colored marks, mm -hmm. dots, like squiggles, lines, and so mm -hmm. forth on it, it's not one of the worrisome species. If it doesn't, if it lacks uh, uh, colored marks, dots and squiggles and so forth on its body, then it might be one of the worrisome species. Mm -hmm. Other than that, the, you've got to memorize a bunch of rules to tell one from another. The males, the adult males of black legged tick are almost totally black or so dark brown it's almost black. The females have uh, uh, black legs and then the, the abdomen is sort of a reddish orange color until they start bloating up with blood, in which case it starts uh, 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 changing to a sort of a dull tannish brown. Are those the ones that blow up really big? Um, all of them do that. Oh, so, they do. Um, like they get that tannish grayish. Yeah. Color and, and if you think if you think of a, a party balloon that you start out maybe oh. it's a dark <laughs> blue, if you blow it up it turns to a light blue because mm -hmm. that pigment is now spread over a right. bigger area. So it right. sort of changes color as it bloats up bigger mm -hmm. and bigger. So do uh, ticks in general disgorge themselves and feed until they get 
to that size? That's, that's what they're programmed to do. Uh, uh, most of our species, except uh, the one called winter tick, are so-called three-host ticks, which means uh, the lucky females that get to live their full life cycle live for two years, and in that time they get to have three meals. And so three meals. Three meals in two years. That's all you get for your life. So they're, they, they're hmm. adapted to when they do feed, they feed a lot and bloat right up. Okay. And, then it and has that to will hold them for a period of time. Long, long until time. Until they feel that they need to find another host to until they're ready. feed yeah. on. Is that the basic life cycle of, of a tick in general? That for most of our species, so they start off as eggs. Mm, as eggs. Eggs are okay. laid in masses, in groups of several hundred. Okay. And then uh, the eggs hatch into larvae, and the larvae wait on uh, uh, leaf litter and so forth for a host to brush by and come in contact with them. Most oh. of our species don't even have eyes, so they, they, they find their host by touch, by feeling that having the host brush them or the okay. host's fur or clothing or hair or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they feed for a few days drop off, transform over a few weeks to the next stage, which and is And is the that nymph. because they have fed that they're ready to go into the next stage? Once they've the completely feeding. fed, which takes several days, mm -hmm. then they drop off and transform. They gotta digest that huge meal and change to the next stage. So it takes weeks and sometimes months between the stages. So they start as eggs, then hatch into larvae, uh, then uh, they eventually transform into nymphs and finally as adults, and then the adults mate, lay more eggs, and the cycle starts all over again. So at what point uh, would we actually see the larvae on a leaf or a brush if we were out? Um, it would be hard if you, uh, you, you'd be looking on the ground to find them. Um, they're awfully tiny. The larvae are something on the order of six-tenths of a millimeter long. Yeah. So uh, I've got a photo that I took in my lab of a head of a common pin, and one of them doesn't even span the head of a common pin, so mm -hmm. they're pretty small. Mm -hmm. Wow. And with the... Um, is that where we would find them, is on the ground you mentioned? A leaf litter, most common in the ground to some, some extent. Ticks um, need relatively moist conditions. Yeah. So bare ground you won't find very many because it's too likely that they'll dry out and die. So leaf litter is a perfect situation and thick vegetation is another. Mm -hmm. So they're not really up on tree trunks, or they could be on a tree. Tr they could be on a tree, but probably no higher okay. than a few inches. They okay. they they wouldn't be up in the crown of a tree because it's uh, so they don't drop too down on you as you're walking out. through. That's right. right. Okay. That's right. Okay. Isn't that a relief? Mm -hmm. it, it is. <laughs> so it's more the brush keep to the trail and not wander into the brush. Yep. And Tall grass, thick brush. That's okay. where they like it. Right. Right. Wow, and um, their hosts are um, any animal that is warm-blooded or? Any, any warm-blooded animal, and actually, um, if we're, well, there's a couple of species that occasionally will ta attack uh, reptiles, not so commonly up here, mm -hmm. but for us, basically a warm-blooded uh, animal, so it could be a bird, it could be a mammal, um, they're all perfectly good hosts so long as the ticks can find them. In other words, right. touch, come into contact with them. So uh, once it comes into contact, is it body temperature that lets them know they found a host, or is it a scent, or how do they, or do they just? It's a combination of tactile and chemo receptors. Um, they, uh, when they're ready, they're so-called questing. They have their front pair of legs out and they're waiting for a host to come into contact with them. <laughs> so <lucky> when, <laughs> I, when I sample for ticks, I drag oh. a cloth over the vegetation. Mm. They think it's a host and grab on and, and hold on. Okay. And then they also have the ability to detect CO2 and a couple other things through some receptors in their front tarsi. So, they, so that when they've landed on, on something, they get a clue right away as to whether it's really a host or whether it was another branch that passed by, in which case they stop and start questing again. Mm -hmm. So they can, a combination of those things. Mm -hmm. um, do you, is there a website that people can go to that if they're concerned they've been bitten by a tick and they have um, the tick itself? 
that they can go and see some images of the different types of ticks, that maybe they can do a comparison. Uh, yes. Both Abby and I have websites that uh, uh, the Health and Human Services one and Cooperative Extensions website, and we can give you those uh, URLs mm -hmm. that have some of that. Um, you can identify the adults of most of the species relatively easily with perhaps a magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. But when you get to the immatures, you really need an expert and a microscope. Okay. There's a really good new handbook on the CDC website too that has mm -hmm. really excellent pictures of the ticks, distributions, diseases that they carry for the entire United States. So it's not just, you know, New England specific. Right. Um, but there's a that's a really good resource too. It has really nice, and it's just okay. the adults, like Alan was saying, because it's really it's really hard for someone that's not an entomologist to identify the younger life stages. Mm -hmm. besides and the, the CDC's adults. website is really easy to use. Mm -hmm. That's okay. a great suggestion. Yeah. Okay. And um, so talking about um, ticks, can we be more specific as far as what is the season here in New Hampshire? Is there um, a sp specific months where you tend to find them and that they've hatched in you know, I don't know how long they stay in the egg form. If you're asking the question about ticks in general, then the answer is all year. Oh, really? For instance, we've got one called winter tick, which is active during the winter. But oh, if gee. we're talking about the disease-carrying ones, mm -hmm. then the adults are mostly spring and fall in their activity periods. And the nymph's activity period starts about May 15th or so and goes through the entire month of June and a fair amount into July. Mm -hmm. And then if it's really dry, it kind of shuts a lot of activity down. Mm -hmm. But there's still some that are active in, in August and early September. So spring and fall for the adults and May 15 to June to, to July 5 or 10 or something like that. That's mm -hmm. the, the, the time for the nymphs. That's the riskiest time of year. Okay. And that lines up nicely with the data that we see too with the reports of disease that we have. You have a nice bell curve of during the nymphal activity, the May through August-ish time frame. Mm -hmm. We still have cases reported year round which can reflect some of the adult activity too and they're a risk factor just right. like the nymphs but they're easier to detect on yourself. Well that's an eye opener because I think um, many of us believe that once the the ground is frozen, the cold weather has come, there's no more ticks. There's no reason to put that front line on my dog any longer or to worry about being bit by a tick. But it sounds like we really need to be diligent year round. I mean... Yeah, win winter, the, the winter tick, of course, is uh, not a disease carrying thing. And so it's, it's not really a threat. But black legged tick, um, I have collected or had turned into me every month of the year except August. Uh -huh. So uh, even in January, if there's a mild period when mm -hmm. the temperature reaches 42 or 43 degrees and there's no snow on the ground, it'll be active. So they actually live for two years, you mentioned. They're just not as active in the winter. In cooler, in really cold temperatures, mm -hmm. they're 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 not very active. They they're need, dormant, they but they don't die about. out. No, no. Oh, okay. I thought they did. <laughs> uh, and in fact, uh, this winter we had all kinds of nice snow and ice, and it just sealed them in very nicely. It kept them insulated. Kept them from drying out. Well, it isn't the insulation; it keeps it from drying out. Oh. And drying out is the like biggest mortality yeah. factor. So. That's why they did so very well this winter. Mm. We had good snow cover. It uh, protected them. Mm -hmm. Are there specific areas of the state that tend to be a little more populated with, with ticks? Uh, yes, it's and in fact, there. that map that I've got that I showed you earlier mm -hmm. and that's on the website uh, shows my data from the last 25 years, and it strongly shows that uh, the southeast seems to have the highest uh, numbers of these things and within about 35 or so miles of the coast. And so Rockingham, mm -hmm. parts of Hillsborough County, yeah. Stratford County seem to have the highest numbers, but there are other places that have uh, moderate numbers. The lowest numbers seem to be the high elevation places 
and we don't know much about the North Country because I just haven't done enough sampling okay. up there. Okay. Now I know with like mosquitoes we can spray um, to try to um, eliminate some. Is there anything like that that's being done? Any research or anything that can be done to try to, pr I mean, the brush and the leaves? There are, there are plenty of, in, of uh, sprays that can be applied to control ticks. If you wish to use that technique, that's mm -hmm. one option. Okay. You don't have to use it. Okay. Um, and properly done, uh, one of the uh, synthetic uh, uh, tick killing agents, I was going to say an insecticide, but it's really an acaricide, uh, properly applied one treatment a year, mm -hmm. one at the right time, will knock the tick population down quite a ways. So, and the, the best time is early June, actually, mm -hmm. for black-legged tick. Mm -hmm. So it is an option. So is that something that an individual would do, or a town would take measures to do? Um, if you wish, either one can do so. Details on how to do it are in my tick publication, which is at the website we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, Kirby Stafford also includes details in the tick handbook mm -hmm. that uh, Abby mm -hmm. refers to. Okay. And uh, so there's places where you can learn the materials and the timing. Mm -hmm. I tell people that a commercial firm is usually more effective at doing it than most most backyard people okay. would be because they have the equipment and the power sprayers and so forth to to uh, to mix up the leaf litter and so forth and right. get it, get it to, to work. A light spray. spray that wafts down and yeah. settles on the top isn't going to do as much. Right, right. So uh, it, it's an option and details are mm -hmm. on the publications. Mm -hmm. So there are um, companies here in New Hampshire that can do that. Yep. Mm -hmm. if, you ca if you can't Never do it or don't want to, there are plenty of them available. Many of them are pest control companies that mm -hmm. you can find in the yellow pages or other directories. Wow. Seems like a good business, I would think, with the population rising. Um, I would think this would be a good time of year to be doing it. For the illnesses that they carry, um, you would think that they would, wouldn't be able to keep up. Well, uh, one caution I would say around that, though, is that there's not really been any studies showing that there's been an actual reduction in, in disease incidence based on the spring. Mm -hmm. So it does reduce your entomological exposure risk, mm -hmm. but nothing definitive has been shown that it's going to be a stand-in for doing the daily tick checks and the showers after you come in and making right. sure you wear light-colored clothing and wearing repellents and tucking your pants into your socks oh. and your shirt into your pants mm. and things Those like that. Are so good it's ideas. Yeah. And it, so. I would worry that it would cause a false sense of security. I'm not saying don't do it mm -hmm. because it certainly will reduce your exposure to ticks, mm -hmm. but don't use that as a stand-in for doing some of the other preventative measures that are very simple to do right. and very effective to do. Right. So you mentioned wearing light-colored clothes while you're out yep. so they can show up, mm -hmm. tucking in, maybe pulling your socks up over your pant mm -hmm. legs. Okay. What other measures? You can wear repellent. You can get repellent for your clothes that you can mm -hmm. wash in or spray in. Depend There's a whole bunch and of options that And is that a that different way. repellent than like the mosquito and fly repellent? Is it can be the same thing. It can be the yeah. same, the D or... Yeah, it can serve a dual purpose. And mm -hmm. um, there's a really good EPA website that has a selector tool. So you okay. can say ticks or mosquitoes, how long type of product, you know. Okay, so it would be worthwhile to spray. Mm -hmm. Are there other measures to take? Doing the daily tick checks. Mm -hmm. Showering after you come inside is very effective. The landscape modification that Alan mentioned with the with Kirby Stafford's plan, having the border around the yard, um, it's about three feet wide. He ha goes into a lot of detail in that. Oh, so what is that? Is it some type of um, landscaping border that acts as a barrier for them? Yeah, pea stone yeah. or, ch or, or wood chips mulch, or something. Yeah. Oh. Also, uh, he hmm. talks about moving play equipment mm -hmm. away from the edge of the woods and a few other tricks. What yeah. else have we forgotten? There's always the deer exclusion fences. They're doing studies on the mouse bait boxes. So the, do they feel that the deer actually carry the black-legged tick onto well, it property and they drop off? or It well. turns out that deer are quite important in the abundance of this particular species. Hmm. And so there have been studies in the Northeast that have demonstrated that uh, the, this black-legged tick numbers tend to pick up in places where the deer population is strong. It helps them along. 
but they're not absolutely required for it. So I guess that's the way to say it. Hmm. Um, would you say would you say it any differently than that? No, I mean it, the the deer clearly plays a very important role in their life cycle. And is that so because we have such a large population of deer that it seems that they're no the in my conversations with fish and game yeah. personnel, they're saying that relative to the other New England states, we have a fairly low population of deer. Oh. Hmm. Um, but it do, it is in a U kind of that the herd is mostly in a U in the southern part of the state. And if oh. you look at some of the hmm tick distribution maps, that's kind of matches. It matches up well. But it is spreading, I mean it is, you know, we do have um, reports from Coos and other points north of Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. So we know the tick must be there, people can be traveling, but they think in the New England area, most of the Lyme disease is contracted peridomestically, so around your home, mm -hmm. is what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't have complete travel history data on the cases that we have, so it's really hard to say one way or the other. Mm -hmm. But that's the the general. Mm -hmm. So process. it's really really important to take those precautions, mm -hmm. um, especially for young children or or teens that like to go out exploring in the woods and and, and kind of uh, creating their own path through right. the woods where they're not sticking to a paved trail. Um, they're brushing against the. Um, the trees and brush out there and the leaves um, where they can easily come in contact um, with the ticks. So um, we know that we can get Lyme disease from the black-legged tick. Um, tell me a little bit about that disease and maybe um, how, well start with the tick bite I guess and, and what to start looking for, some of the symptoms, treatment. Sure. So with Lyme disease, of the diseases that we have in New Hampshire transmitted by the black-legged tick, Lyme disease is the only one that really produces a rash, the erythema migrans, um, which is different than the tick bite hypersensitivity reaction, which will be more of like a little nodule, a little bit red, mm -hmm. maybe hard, maybe warm. Um, the erythema migrans rash will be a spreading rash that will get bigger rather than starting okay. to heal. Okay, so we'll start as um, just a little circle around where the bite is and that and will just continue to get larger and larger as the days go on? To a certain point. I mean, it's not going to mm -hmm. encompass cover your whole the, body. It's not going to cover your whole body. <laughs> right. um, but you'll, it'll be getting bigger rather than getting smaller as time goes on, mm -hmm. which is the, one of the bigger hallmarks. It can also have a central clearing. There's lots of different presentations of erythema migraine. Is it generally red? Generally red. Warm to the touch, maybe? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. But what that is indicative of is the bacteria, the Borrelia burgdorferi, that's the causative agent of mm -hmm. Lyme disease, moving out. Mm. Um, getting through your system. Getting, yeah, moving through the skin and spreading out. So if, uh, there's been studies where people have taken a sample of your skin if you have a spreading rash and they can find organisms there moving. Um, so incubation time frame for that is three to 32 days around there. Mm -hmm. 60 to 80 percent of people will have that. Uh, when we looked at our data for 2012, I think 60 percent of our cases, confirmed cases, had erythema migraines. So there's, well, there's the caveat with surveillance data that we don't necessarily get all those erythema migraines cases because testing early on, if if your body hasn't had a chance to mount an immune response, you're not necessarily going to have a positive test even though mm. you have the organism, mm -hmm. the pathogen. So we won't necessarily get all the data, um, but there's that's a perfect time to be going to the doctor. You can do pro, a prophylactic dose of the doxycycline, which is um, the main treatment for Lyme mm -hmm. disease. You can't use doxycycline in pregnant women or children at less than eight. There's other treatments that you can use for that, but mm -hmm. you, so then you can't do a prophylactic dose. But mm -hmm. if you have a confirmed bite from a black-legged tick, you can do identification with Alan Eaton or with the state entomologist, Pierre Seert. Okay. Um, so it's really important for you to hold on to that tick. Um, if you've been bitten and you've so. developed yeah. a rash, what is the best way to um, to keep that tick? Put it in a little jar or put it on scotch tape. Um, is there is there a better way to? 
Abby knows that I don't like ticks attached to scotch tape. I have to <laughs> yeah. fight because, of course, you have to, to identify, you have to look at the edge and everything, and on scotch tape, you can't do that. But right. putting it in a little baggie or some other oh, container, like a little Ziploc including bag. Okay. A, a, a little label so you remember. I like can't the date remember of the when date it was, and where it was. Right. And if it was biting you, I write down the date it bit me and, you know, two inches mm -hmm. above right knee I, I, so that right. I can... It, later on, in addition to knowing what the species is, mm -hmm. then if I have the rash that Abby talked mm -hmm. about, I can call my physician and say, I had this appeared and it was nine days ago and I was bitten by, I, it helps me. And so I, right. I write it down, a Ziploc bag or a small container okay. like these, just perfect. Right. Okay, that makes a lot more sense than the scotch tape. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, if they see the rash, they've they've been bitten, they've saved the tick, um, they've been treated um, with it. I mean, it's an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. So um, so after usually that's for 30 days. Antibiotics. Yeah, so would they do 90 days? Yeah. Usually it's like 14 to 21. Okay. Sometimes up to a month. Mm -hmm. There's um, no concrete evidence of persistent. Lyme disease, chronic active infection. So that, I don't know if that's more what you were trying to. Oh well, I'm trying to understand that once you've been treated with the antibiotics, is there no reason to be alarmed that the treatment has been, you know, you've you've done the, you know, 14 days or 21 days of the antibiotics, but what if you start experiencing just really feeling lethargic or, or getting headaches or I, I don't know what some of those symptoms are of Lyme disease. Those uh, are all, it can be very the, vague flu-like oh, symptoms. Okay. You can have joint pains, muscle pains. Mm. Um, if you don't get treatment mm -hmm. quickly, you can develop some neurological oh, wow. problems, meningitis, oh, cranial neuritis, okay. where you wow. have Bell's palsy and facial okay. paralysis. You can wow. have Lyme carditis. There's real um, serious conditions. You can have real serious problems, if and you don't get treated. Yeah, and even sometimes, if you do get treated, you can have what's called post Lyme disease syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, so you can have long-lasting effects from this, not necessarily because of an active infection, although you can get reinfected okay. with Lyme once you have it. So. Uh, so the active infection, um, it, it's active until you finish the treatment of the antibiotics. Okay, but you can get reinfected mm -hmm. if you're bit again. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's, I know um, some people that I've spoken with did not, did not know that, and so they oh. thought, you know, I've had it once, and so I'm oh. going to be okay. Mm -hmm. it's, but it's, okay. you can certainly get reinfected with it. Um, yeah, your body hasn't built up a right. immunity or antibody to fight getting bit again. Right. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So there are um, potential long-lasting sequelae that you can have or secondary problems from having had Lyme disease. But if you either do the prophylactic dose, if you've had that tick bite that's been attached for 36 hours, they've deviated from being flat, so you know they've fed some. Um, and it's within a 72-hour time frame of when you've pulled it, then you can do the prophylactic dose to try and prevent mm. coming down with clinical signs of Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. But you should continue to, nothing's 100%, so it may not 100% of the time prevent disease. So you should always monitor yourself for signs and symptoms of either developing a rash or if your joints start to hurt or mm -hmm. you're starting to have flu-like symptoms and you're just concerned, you should always talk to your doctor about that. And it's a disease that cannot be transferred or transmitted from person to person. Right. By touch or drinking out of the same water glass or anything right. like or that. Or from your pet to you or you to your pet. Mm -hmm. Dogs do get Lyme disease as well. And they so do. There's, mm -hmm. I know there have been some concerns about, can I get it from my dog? But okay. you can't. Okay. Indeed, and some of the other repellents mm -hmm. um, are very effective. Alan has a really very good, good. Very okay, good. yeah, I may have to start. I never page. think of using bug spray because I use it for mosquitoes or um, never think of using that for ticks. And you, you would use it perhaps a little differently. Okay. So uh, uh, the, you'd have to look at the label of your material and find out what the active ingredients were and see if the label said it was for ticks, for one thing. Okay. But secondly, 
the prime areas would be around your ankles and your lower pant legs and socks. You mm. wouldn't bother all up up here or, or your ne neck or anything. Uh, right, so they tend to... Most of them you're to going to encounter down low, so that's where you use them. Grab on, as you said, as you're passing through, they just kind of leech on to or grab on to that host walking by, and then they kind of walk their way up until they find... Until they find a spot. A spot that seems moist and ready to... Okay. There was one other good prevention tip that Alan had when, um, when I was watching your video online about wearing those like knee boots. I wear I wear 16 inch high boots for a lot of my field work, and it's just I did it to keep my feet relatively dry, but they're so slick um, the ticks wow. can't grab hold, and I noticed okay. very quickly that I wasn't get anywhere, getting anywhere near as many ticks hmm. on me when I mm -hmm. wore those. So that's an mm -hmm. additional thing I'd forgotten about. Oh, that that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. When was Lyme disease discovered? Because it seems like a fairly new disease that we've been hearing more and more about in the last, I don't know, five to ten years, or maybe that's because it's being diagnosed more accurately, or like you said, we're getting a much larger population of ticks. So what? in the mid-70s in okay. Connecticut, Lyme, Connecticut, which is Oh, it, and that is why it's called Lyme disease. Okay. Um, is when it really became um, known as a disease. There, I was just reading something recently about how they've actually gone back and looked at some white-footed mouse museum samples and specimens and things like that, and they found evidence of it back into the, I think it was the late 1800s, early 1900s. Oh. Documentation mm. of the organism being there, but hmm. not really documentation of human illness relative to it. But since, since that time, there's been a lot of change in the landscape, especially in this area. Um, we went from deforestation to reforestation, reintroduction of the deer, mm. much more greening of our space, which is great. Um, but that brings us closer in contact with both the reservoir species, the white-footed mouse. There's some other ones, chipmunks, robins, um, other animals. So it's not, I don't want to villainize just one species or the other. Right. Um, but then, you know, we also get the, the bigger mammals, the white-tailed deer coming in and serving mm -hmm. as the reproductive hosts. And so it's just been this blossom of going back to nature and mm. Mm -hmm. that the spread of the vectors, the spread of the reservoirs and hosts has led to us having part of the reason of having an increased incidence, mm -hmm. both of tick encounters and of Lyme wow. disease. What is the percentage of ticks? Do you have any idea what percentage are infected? Yes, yeah, so we, from 2007 to 2010, there was a study done where the ticks collected were tested for Lyme, Anaplasma, Babesia, um, throughout the state of New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and we there weren't enough ticks collected for Coas County to really give much of an indication of what the infection rate there was. But across the state, mm -hmm. about 60% of the ticks at that point in time oh, wow. were infected with the Borrelia organism. We're hoping that we're going to be getting funding to expand our entomological surveillance. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping mm -hmm. to be doing more testing for Lyme, but also for Anaplasma, Babesia, and Powassan if we can. Mm -hmm. And Abby um, and I are in cahoots where I'm collecting yeah. the ticks already, yeah. so we're we're ready to we're, ready to get more tested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're hoping to have a real good program with that coming too. So we'll have a better idea of what's happening because we have seen an increase in our number of cases of anaplasma, babesia, and last year we had our first case of Powassan. So explain those diseases, which I can't even pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> so anaplasma is another bacteria. It's a rickettsial type organism. So it wants which to be- Which means what? It wants to be in your cells, the Lyme oh, disease. so it really wants to- Yeah, so it'll be mm -hmm. the anaplasma, um, phagocytophilium wants to be in your phagocytes, which are your white blood cells. The Lyme disease pathogen, Borrelia burgdorferi, is an extracellular mm -hmm. modal spirochete, and so okay. it'll, it can move around in your body that way. Mm -hmm. But the anaplasma organisms um, want to be within your white cells. Okay. Babesia is a red blood cell parasite similar to malaria. Um, mm -hmm. Many people are asymptomatic for Babesia, but those that get sick can get really sick. Uh, there's some risk with blood transfusion with that, so they, they you know, we keep kind of keep track yeah, of that too. That. Mm -hmm. Powassan is actually an arboviral disease, arthropod-borne 
um, virus. So that can have symptoms of your other arboviral diseases like West Nile and Tripoli where you'll have meningitis, neurological symptoms like that. Mm. But you can also have asymptomatic people with Powassan. And, and does it animals. stay dormant for a while and five years later you would start showing symptoms? No, no so the you're Powassan either gonna... wouldn't. The okay. Powassan wouldn't. You could, mm -hmm. for, um, there's a chance with like Babesia or something like that if you were all of a sudden immunocompromised or something happened, okay. then maybe, but mm -hmm. Um, not likely. Mm -hmm. And are these diseases um, caused by the black-legged tick or is there another type of tick that's carrying those? All of these are being vectored by the black-legged tick All of again. them, mm -hmm. okay. So the simple prevention nasty critter. messages can prevent not just yeah. Lyme disease but other diseases, other diseases that, diseases, that, that yeah. are even aren't as right. well known but certainly have some serious consequences. And if the website detected. to which Abby referred, mm -hmm. uh, so Dr. Matthewson's information is on their website on all of these diseases okay. and other places as so well. So we'll be sure so to you reference can, you can that. Easily yeah. find mm -hmm. access to good information on yeah. these. Mm -hmm. And it's important to remember that during the summer months when you're traveling for school vacations, there's tick borne diseases other places in the in country other states. too. Yeah. So is New England or New Hampshire tend to be one of the higher incidences of Lyme disease? I mean, it sounds like the tick population is just rampart. Mm -hmm. we're, we're number one. We're number one. In the, in the, in the CDC way. tracks the incidence by state. Are we really? And we are number mm. one. Uh, Ver Maine is number two. Vermont is number three currently. Mm -hmm. So, but if you wow. go towards the Midwest, you find much, much less. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, Upper Midwest has some. The climate. There's a pocket around yeah. Wisconsin and Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota. Minnesota. Again, well, Wisconsin, is it all the lakes or? Uh, there's there's three really. patches in the country, and, and, and one is the eastern seaboard, yep. uh, started so out along the coast. Damp. And then that lakes region. Moisture more. Uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And in the Pacific Northwest, is it Washington or, or somewhere, somewhere in the Pacific yeah. Northwest as well? Mm -hmm. And those are the hot spots in the country. Mm -hmm. and I guess I like Oregon, the, you mentioned. I, I don't know about the others, but that's the Lyme disease pattern. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's well, anaplasma follows that too. It um, does. Yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. The something maybe I should have mentioned before is so there's the black legged tick in the southern part of the country too, but they, for whatever reason, prefer reptilian hosts is something that I had been reading that I had oh. meant to talk to you too. So hmm. they're not good reservoirs for Lyme disease. So they do have those ticks, right? but it's a completely different ecology. And so if you think yeah. about it, these hmm. are opportunistic organisms that whatever host comes along. And so if you live in Virginia hmm. or North Carolina or South Carolina and there are lizards available, and so forth, then every once in a while you feed on a lizard rather than so a host that's good for this, then it, it, it messes up the whole right. system and they don't have anywhere near as much. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, so as long as there's blood to feed on, mm -hmm. it, the temperature really doesn't have anything mm -hmm. uh, to uh, some, do with it. Some of the ticks will accept cold-blooded hosts mm. and uh, Ixodes scapularis is one of those. Wow. Uh, there are others as well, but of course up here there aren't too many opportunities for right, that. Right, right. Do we have numbers on how many people in the state of New Hampshire that have come down with Lyme disease? In 2013 it was 1689, I believe. Wow, um, okay, so almost 1700. Almost 1700, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, our data fluctuates a little bit as we go forward in time because we'll accept reports for a little while. Um, afterwards, after we close our data off when we transmit it to the CDC so they can start working on the national picture. Mm -hmm. um, they do think there is fairly severe underreporting of Lyme disease, so I think nationally 30,000 cases were reported, but they're thinking more like 300,000 cases were actually So being underreported, is that they're not being diagnosed or they're being diagnosed and those figures just aren't getting? Maybe both. Okay. Um, but yeah. certainly, certainly getting the information from the providers can be a problem, but also um, making sure the diagnosis is correct and timely and 
It oh seems like the individual, we need to be really proactive mm -hmm. at when we are bitten by a tick. Mm -hmm. Make a note, keeping that tick, because that's going to help keep a more accurate count and track of what's happening. Um, mm -hmm. And if you have any concerns, if you have a tick bite and you're starting to feel mm -hmm. ill, make sure you call your provider. Mm -hmm. um, you can certainly, even if you're not feeling ill after you've had a tick bite, speak with your provider and see if it would be appropriate to have a prophylactic dose of mm -hmm. medication to prevent Lyme disease that will not prevent anaplasma, babesia, or powassan. Okay. Um, and if you're unlucky enough, that one tick could have multiple things. Oh. Yeah. So oh, just because wow. Which makes it even harder to yeah. diagnose, I'm sure. Right, right. Mm -hmm. and the treatment for Lyme disease and anaplasma luckily is the same. Okay. Um, so there's just supportive care for Powassan. Mm -hmm. The treatment for Babesia is similar to um, malaria, but again, it's although uncommon, we are seeing increasing incidence of anaplasma and Babesia. Anaplasma wasn't um, really on anybody's radar until the 90s too, so we're just starting to be more aware of some of these diseases, which is part of the reason why we're starting to see increases too, mm -hmm. I think. Um, Are you so noticing any particular age group that has a higher incident of Lyme disease? We do. Um, children tend to have a higher incidence when we, when we break it out by age group. Mm -hmm. Males a little bit more than the females, um, but that could very easily be explained by what they like to do and go out and play and that maybe they're not as good about doing tick checks themselves or letting their parents mm -hmm. do their tick checks. There's certainly occupational risk that we see. Um, you know, the, the men that are going out and doing a lot of hunting, mm -hmm. women do that too, but it's, it seems predominantly to be a male activity. A lot of those outdoor sports we do um, we see a heavy predominance in males in doing that and in our cases. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's certainly that to be thinking of. Right, so s certain occupations you're at a higher risk, which makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, tell me what we should do if we find a tick. If I find a tick on me, what, what would I do? Don't is immediately it, go and just <laughs> freak, freak yank out. it off. And, ah. <laughs> so is this a biting tick? Well, how do you know? Well, if it's attached, if it's if walking along. If it's attached, along, it's, it's biting. It's, okay. Mm -hmm. So if it's attached by, you know, attached by its mouth parts, biting. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, uh, remove it promptly. Uh, what, so and what is a proper way to remove a tick? Because I know the, they have special um, I didn't bring utensils my little, to be able to remove them from dogs. I didn't bring my little dog. tick spoon. I've got it in my, my box either. here somewhere. Okay, so but it's a I little. use a pair of forceps because I entomologists okay. have those. They're little fine ones so I can grab it by the head. Okay. I don't want to grab it by the rear of the body. I want to grab it by the head. Okay. And the tick spoons are little, little plastic devices that have a little notch in them. Okay. And you can just fit the notch the mouth parts through the notch and then lever the tick right out. Really? Even so something as small as the little black legged properly. tick? Mm -hmm. And so okay. that's the way to do it. When I was mm -hmm. a kid, I was taught you touch it with a hot match or you slather it with Not Vaseline. When it's on your <laughs> and um, right, it'll with make the Vaseline it let go. But or of course, nail polish that doesn't do it. Um, to kind of suffocate. I think that was the thinking that it would suffocate. Um, and, and, and die. And we worry that if you do that, if you touch a hot match or slather it with Vaseline, mm -hmm. that it might inject you with spirochetes in the time it right, takes it for would it to suffocate and so forth. So we, we, we don't know, but we worry about that. That so makes sense. Physical removal, prompt removal, mm -hmm. and then I'd put it in a container, put a label, mark down where I was bitten. Mm -hmm. And if I was a person that was especially sensitive to a problem, I might call my physician right away. Well, what would you say relative to the advising the physician part of it? Do you, do you wait? Well, it depends. Like, it, so it depends on how long it's been attached. If you, um, well, if you you're, may not know. Right. Usually, I mean. But if there's any kind of deviation from the flatness of the tick, then you know it's been attached long enough okay. to feed. And I guess you need to stop and think, what did I do today? Was I out in the garden or, you know, was I grocery shopping? Okay, well, me, yesterday I was out, so it's been attached for a day. Well, so even if you have been inside all day, but you oh. have a dog or a cat that's been going in and out, oh. they can mm. carry in mm -hmm. ticks like that, um, and they can drop them or crawl up onto your sofa or 
cuddle up with you when you're going to sleep at night or something like that. Mm -hmm. So they can be a vector for the ticks. Right. So you need to be aware of that and when your pets are coming in and out, do a quick check on them too, mm -hmm. make sure they're wearing their appropriate preventatives as well. Mm -hmm. um, dogs do have a vaccine, humans do not, but dogs do have a vaccine so they can be protected from the disease that way. A vaccine, like a shot? Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, dogs have a, have a Lyme vaccine. Humans used to have one. Okay. Um, it was pulled from the market in the United States in about 2002. Um, there's a, a trial going on in Europe right mm -hmm. now looking at, so Europe is also another area that has Lyme disease. They have different Borrelia species that are um, indicated over there, but they're working on a vaccine that will cover all the different species okay. of the Borrelia. Yeah. So do your animals share ticks with you? No, they don't go outside. They don't two, go outside. I have two cats oh, and they do not go outside. Go outside. <laughs> I don't want to worry about that well, or <laughs> toxoplasmosis or affecting yeah. the wildlife or anything like that. So they right, stay inside. right. Well, um, my dog, when I let him out, he has to go to the woods to do his thing. He's been trained to go to the woods to do his thing. So I don't have to pick up anything in the yard. But here I am encouraging him to bring ticks back into the house now that you mention it because he's very particular. It's got to be a leafy you know, area, he won't go. <laughs> um, so um, I'm not helping the tick population. <laughs> well, I'm helping the tick population, not preventing the Lyme disease. Right. Um, but uh, the pets are a part of the family, so I think it's very important for us to be aware that um, there are measures to prevent them from getting the ticks, mm -hmm. and also yeah. that they can be carriers. So. Yes. Um, that, that is key. And I think that you will use that word, and I think that's really important, awareness. If we can raise people's awareness, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things you can do mm -hmm. to reduce your risk. And we've talked about a lot of them here, and some people, mm -hmm. they have the reaction that uh, uh, you hear about these diseases, so you don't want to go outside, you want to stay in where you won't get exposed mm -hmm. to any of these things. My gosh, we've got beautiful state with all kinds of things oh, to yeah. explore. You can get out there and enjoy it, but if we can raise people's awareness to realize that there's plenty of things they can do to reduce, or I suppose increase their risk of getting mm -hmm. one of these, mm -hmm. then uh, forewarned is forearmed. And mm -hmm. if we could get everybody to practice some of these preventative tactics, then the, instead of 1,600 cases a year, we'd be maybe talking about 1,000 or maybe yeah. even less. Wouldn't that be great? Mm -hmm. I think education, and the more educated you are about it, and it's not to, to strike fear in you, but it's just to be proactive yep. right. and to avoid, I mean, there's some serious consequences to getting any of these illnesses yeah, there, that we've yeah, talked about are. today. So if there are measures that you can take, it would be foolish not to take them, especially if you have children. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the children need to get out to play. Mm -hmm. So Well, the adults do too. I mean, it's, it's good right, for your mental right, health. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sort of like <laughs> what Dr. Eaton was saying, it's good to get out there and explore. Mm -hmm. It is a beautiful state. Mm -hmm. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, I would, I would feel badly if anybody was staying inside right. for fear of these things because there are ways you can prevent it. Right. Well, it sounds like your websites have more than enough information for people to uh, just get some general education, but if they even want to go a little deeper, uh, um, it sounds like you have plenty of information. Is there anything that we did not discuss that maybe you would like to add? There. Well, one thing prevention-wise that we did not talk about maybe we should have is minimizing the rodent and bird population right around your home yeah. is a good way to try oh. and reduce ticks too because those are the animals that are going to be carrying the larval nymph ticks that could possibly be. Hmm. So the bird feeders that we have out hmm. there. In my, on my property I feed the birds and I recognize that I'm increasing mm -hmm. the risk. The bird feeder is only 30 feet from the wood pile yeah. and every time mm -hmm. I take the wood out to bring stuff in in the, in the fall uh, this several uh, white-footed mouse nests in the pile mm. so I know they're there there's chipmunks in my yard as well and so that's one yeah. thing that we do that can increase our risk a little bit I guess so long as we're aware of it as and understand that we yeah. may be creating this mm. I think that's part of it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what else yeah. have we not mentioned I think we've covered most most aspects there's always you know, we're always available for 
consultation about anything. If oh, people great. have questions, mm -hmm. they can always call or... Mm -hmm. Do you, you know. have any type of volunteer base uh, where, you know, people are actively uh, maybe out looking and collecting ticks? I've thought about that myself mm -hmm. and people have volunteered to give me observations, but of course I'm concerned that if I'm going to put it into my database or my map, I want to be sure it's absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. And some of the species you can't mm -hmm. confirm from the other lookalikes without a microscope. Right, right. But one thing that I'm doing this fall where I'm looking for some volunteers is to, uh, uh, I'll be training some people to assist me at uh, hunter deer check stations. Oh. We, we may do the moose season as well. Well, I'm not sure yet. So you sure actually yet. check the deer that ha have... We're looking, we're looking at deer that are brought in. The requirement is a hunter has to bring in the deer yep. within 24 hours right. of the kill and it has mm -hmm. to be checked and, and, and by a hmm. biologist and given a number and so mm -hmm. forth so they can track what the kill rate is. Okay. So we're right there wow. examining. I have a particular protocol I follow and it feeds a lot of information into our uh, mapping so we know where these things are that's how we discovered we have a hot spot in northern Grafton County for example okay. so um, that's one of the things where I can train people to help out a bit and it's for specific times that mm -hmm. happen during the deer hunting mm -hmm. season do you um, want to provide a phone number or an email address in fact I'll do that and if people are interested I'd be very happy uh, we we're getting we're getting closer to the time that we'll have these specific dates because the dates that will need people vary geographically, the particular sites you go to. Okay. And uh, we'll have more data on that uh, uh, probably by the 1st of July. Okay. And uh, so there's one thing that I'm mm -hmm. doing anyway. Um, I can't speak mm -hmm. for Dr. Mathewson. Well, we're both involved with developing the Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases prevention plan. Okay. Um, it's coming from Health and Human Services with input from all the experts in the state. Um, mm -hmm. So that will be something coming out. It's not quite ready yet, but it's certainly in progress. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a document focusing on prevention, not necessarily diagnosis or treatment or anything like that, mm -hmm. but the some of the steps that we've been talking about today about um, what would be good for the state to recommend, what would be good for individuals to be thinking about doing. Mm -hmm. um, Even awareness kind of in the public schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It sounds yep. like that would be great to send little notices home, you know, well, in, we in the spring. We send out communications to, um, to mm -hmm. the school nurses, to providers every spring. Mm -hmm. All that some ready-made flyers that make it real easy for them. We have to get some of that approach. on our website that you can okay. you can get publications that way. We're also Good. in the process of developing some educational materials for kids, like mm -hmm. activity booklets and oh. things like that that we're going to be hoping okay. to pilot still this right, year. Right, right. So it's certainly something on our radar that we're trying to develop and make sure that it's as good as it can be. Right. The prevention messages right now the main intervention we have and so we want to make sure that you know kids as they're developing their outdoors behaviors that they're going to be being right. mindful of Aware. the ticks and so we want to make sure that we get that message mm -hmm. out to the kids mm -hmm. and make sure they're doing the appropriate checks and having adults remove ticks or helping them do checks or okay. things like that so well you both have a wealth of knowledge you've given us so much information today and um, I really thank you for coming in and sharing that with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thanks for, for asking. Us, yeah. I want to thank you for watching Get the Facts. I hope you've learned a lot about the ticks that are here in New Hampshire and the seriousness of the illnesses that they carry. Once again, my name is Suzanne Bernier-Robinson. Thank you for watching Dairy Community Television.